Hi and welcome to uh, our talk, Backdoor in the Core. Um, my name is Alexander Kro, and I'm a vulnerability researcher at Vectorize. Um, besides that, I'm also a CTF player, and through that community, that's where I le learned this uh, wonderful guy. Um, we've been playing together for a few re years now, and yeah, this is our talk about uh, microcode. He's a grad student at the Danish Technical University, and it's about microcode and hacking uh, CPUs. Uh, but first, before we dig into the microcode itself, we need a little crash course on computer architecture. So what we see up here is a CPU. It's a CPU core uh, from the Skylake processors. Um, inside of it, we have both the front end, that's the up top, and we have the back end uh, down beneath it and some memory subsystem in the bottom. The front end is mostly in charge of doing uh, stuff like fetching new instructions. So that's where your, um, your high level, I'm saying high level for uh, instructions here, uh, that's the um, x86 instructions going in there into the fetch queue and they are getting decoded and then they will be translated into micro operations. And micro operations is what's actually running uh, on the CPU. And micro operations are then scheduled by the backend. Um, the backend is the ALU, so the arithmetic logic unit and floating point unit and stuff like that. And through that, the resulting stuff can go to memory through the memory subsystem. We're only going to take a very tiny section of this CPU and dive into it today. So the one we're diving into is this little tiny section. It's the instruction queue and the decoding phase. So here, when an instru instruction comes in, it goes through the queue, and if it's a very simple instruction, like just a simple move or addition, XOR, something simple like that, it will go straight through the simple decoders, and they have a one-to-one -one sort of mapping between micro operations and the high-level macro operations. So we call it macro operations and micro operations from the ones going deep in the CPU. So more complex instructions will go through the complex decoder. And what we're looking at today is the really heavy uh, instructions. So that's something like return from a system call or like when you enter a hypervised space. Some of these instructions are multiple hundreds of lines long or multiple hundred micro operations long. So they can't just be directly decoded into our micro operations. They go to the ROM and on the ROM we fetch um, yeah, we have like, kind of like our normal CPU. We have microcode, so you have an instruction pointer running through um, and executing code. And today we're looking at that space. So let's look, uh, so yeah, so what, why do we need this? Why do we need this complex set um, uh, of microcode? Well, first of all, we have the complex instructions. Those cannot be directly implemented in transistors, but also, bugs do occur in CPUs. So we, we had like a spectrum meltdown a few years back, setting the scene of all of this. And just a few weeks ago, we saw the SendLead bug. So more and more of these kind of CPU bugs are, po CPU bugs are popping up here and there. And to fix these bugs uh, post-production, we need microcode updates. So besides the ROM area where mi microcode is stored, we also have a small RAM address space. And that is writable, and that's what we're going to look at today. Normally, these updates are signed and uh, encrypted by Intel, so you can't really have that deep dive on the go and look what's actually pushed by Intel to your CPUs. There hasn't really been a way so far to like inspect that, uh, and we'll see what kind of damage we can do with that if we actually get the access. So um, this is a table showing how the address space uh, is laid out uh, inside of these CPUs. It's a very simple address space. It's totally linear. So it goes from uh, 0 down to 0x800, or 8000, sorry. Um, and somewhere in the middle, we see a split going from read-only at uh, 7c00. That's where the writable address space starts. Uh, so that's where we can inject um, microcode. And um, uh, out on the columns, we see the instructions themselves. They are, we have grouped them together in this table because that's how they're grouped in the CPU. We call, they're called triads. Um, so 
One triad is free instructions and one implicit knob instruction. So every fourth instructions would just be an implicit knob. You can't address them, you can't jump to them, but they won't really execute anything. Besides that, we have the last thing, and that's a sequ wo sequence word. It's stored separ separately from the instructions. And the sequence word is what groups these uh, triads together. They are the ones in charge of doing um, flow controls. So they can like do branching based on testings, test instructions and stuff like that. Uh, so let's take the first example of how um, a instruction could be implemented in microcode. This is the X adder instruction. It's exchange and addition in the same time. No, normally we see these x86 instructions as a one atomic thing, but they're actually not. So this x addition um, is composed of these three micro operations. Um, so let's read through it. So the first thing happening is that we take uh, the source register, in this case on the first line, and or it with a zero. The source register is the uh, RPX um, in this case, because it's on that side, and RAX is the destination register. So, ORing with a zero, that just means like that's basically just a move. We move it into temp zero, and temp zero is a physical uh, and temporary register inside the CPU that you normally can't access. Um, yeah, so that's a simple move. Then we do a zero exec. Zero extent, uh, but in this case it's 64 bits, so it's basically just a, again, just a move. So we move it into the uh, R64 uh, source register. So that's basically taking RAX and putting it into RDX. Um, so that's the exchange part of this instruction. After that, we do the final step, and that's the addition. So we take the safe temporary register and add it back into the uh, destination register. And we also store the resulting re value in the destination register. And now, at last, we see the uh, final part. That's the sequence word coming into play. And in this case, it's a symbol uint. And that means that the instruction, the macro instruction, the x at, will end at this point. So we will go and update uh, the instruction pointer and fetch a new one. Now, simple example. So what you saw before was the temp zero register. That's a new one to most of us. Um, that's a temporary register only used inside uh, microcode, and it's not visible to um, yeah to the macrocode. And we got 16 of these register, zero through 15 they're called. Um, of course, microcode can also access all of the normal registers like RX, RBX, and stuff like that. Um, besides that, we got eight uh, floating point registers. Just same thing as the temp registers. There's eight of them for XMM instructions, also temporarily. Then we can, of course, access system, access system registers that can be like a segmentation of memory. Some, some of those registers, they're the ones that hold the state. And last, we have the use state register. And that one will hold um, what what modes the CPUs are running in and all the critical stuff. So like, are we in 32-bit mode? Are we in 64-bit mode? Are we in a hypervised space? And stuff like that. And often the CPU will check that flag and do conditional jumps in microcode based on what state are we in. Are we pr in privileged mode? Are we in kernel space? Stuff like that. Uh, of course, um, from microcode, we can also access memory. There's multiple ways of doing this. One is, for example, the virtual address space, the ones we usually do from macro operations. So we can store, uh, store and read memory just as that. Um, we call, can also access directly through this physical address space, going just uh, around all the page tables and stuff like that. So um, yeah. And besides that, we have some very, very tiny memory dedicated for only uh, microcode uh, and inside the CPU, that's the U-code memory. It's a separate address space from where we are storing the actual instructions. So data and instructions are separate completely, but we are, here we have around 0x100 keywords that we can also use a temporary storage. Um, each entry is 64-bit uh, wide, and it is used, the difference between those and the temporary instructions is that the, these can be used across multiple macro instructions. So temp registers is for 
temporary storage inside one macro instructions, and this can store uh, saved control registers when switching mode and stuff like that, and then we can fetch it out later. So each entry is like has a dedicated purpose. Um, other than that, we also have uh, two buses, or uh, a, a bus and a fabric. These are used for communication within the CPU. Uh, one of the very interesting ones is the control register bus. Um, it can talk to all components inside one single CPU core. That could be the caches uh, that are on the core. So for example, an L1 cache, and maybe an L2, something like that. And besides that, we have the very important one, the microcode sequencer. That is the one in charge of um, scheduling instructions and going through the pipeline. So if we can go to the control register bus, we can access the microcode as well. Um, other than that, we have the Intel on system fabric that is mostly used for external communication. So the HTT driver and USB stuff and other, component, oh, other components that are shared between some of the cores. So that is mostly for external communication outside of uh, the main core. Yes, uh, okay, so now we talked a bit about that. What, how do we place these updates in microcode? So we talked about that it's a ROM area and that is read only. So when in Intel pushes a update, how do they actually update a ROM area? That's where these match and patch registers come into place. Um, what we see here is the bit fields and how a match and patch register is laid out and and we have 32 of these, and each time we fit a new, new instruction, we will check these fields, and uh, if we get a hit, we will jump to that address instead. So we have the present bit that will tell if this match and patch register is enabled, then we have a source field, that is, if we hit this address, go jump to somewhere else, and that will be what's stored in the destination. And as you see up here, um, both source and destination are two U adders, so they are microcode uh, addresses, uh, but they're shifted by one, so we won't lose one bit of position. Um, and we'll talk a bit about how that works. So, so here we have an example of a match and patch register. So let's say our CPU is running and uh, the microcode instruction pointer hits uh, 3C8. Then uh, we have a match and patch hit because we see a entry in the match and patch table with the same value. That means that we will st instead go and uh, jump directly to 7C00 and start executing from there instead. And this is what Intel programs into the CPU every time we apply a microcode update, which happens every, on every reboot. But we also find out through trial and error that this loss in precision means that uh, if we do hit uh, free C9, we would actually also get a hit and then we will drop, jump to the red area instead. So we will jump one micro instruction further on. Yeah. So how can we use this, or should I say abuse this, when researching CPUs? So a lot of things we have been doing is to do dynamic inspection of state, just to fig also to figure out what this code doing, but also to figure out what instruction is doing. So here we have a simple example taken from the ROM. Um, it reads first uh, from the RAM address space into temp3 and temp2, but what if you want to inspect the state? Well, one thing we could do is that we can tell the match and patch registers to go, go and jump somewhere else. So we see the, the overcrossed line, the red line, that is a test use state. And then normally we would, the sequence word will tell it to jump um, somewhere to the general protection fault and do a fault because this is a privileged instruction. Um, but we can change that. So we swap that out and say, go to the RAM area. And in the RAM, we have put our stuff and we will flip the test case. Um, and when we do that, um, we can tell it to either go and take the left path and say, move these temporary registers into the um, into racks and RBX. These are registers that we can inspect from, um, from a debugger and from normal user space. Or if uh, we are in a privileged mode, we don't want to screw up this instruction. So instead, we send it to its normal path and send it back the way we came from so we don't mess up the instruction and the CPU will still continue to function and run happily ever after. Uh, okay, so how do we manage to make these changes? Now, how can we access 
uh, the microcode sequencer when it's all locked down and locked up by Intel. Well, luckily, the people at Positive Technology, they found a vulnerability in the uh, Intel management engine uh, that runs a software called Trusted Execution Unit, and they found a buffer overflow, and that engine runs on a very highly privileged level, and through that, uh, we can enable debug features. Debug features only uh, Intel is supposed to have access to, and that unlocks um, uh, hidden instructions and undocumented instructions. So, um, yeah, we have... Um, we took the POC and expanded it to these dev boards. That's actually the board lying up here that we are presenting from. Um, and we have, of course, prepared uh, flash images and stuff that you can flash on. So if you buy one of these, you can go and replicate uh, some of our findings. Um, yeah. The two instructions that we mostly use um, is the udebug read and the udebug write. These two instructions can uh, write to uh, microcode. It can read the data and read and write to the, the data errors we talked before. The write instruction also has a special feature where you can put in an address in the RAGS register and just tell it to go jump straight to an address you specify in the microcode area. And it can also talk to the control register bus that we talked about before. So that's how we access all of these microcode features. Um, really good findings over at the post technology side. Uh, but yeah, so we tried all of this. We made our rub chain and we got access to these instructions. And we found this repo um, called Custom Processing Unit. It's a assembler that someone wrote for uh, assembling microcode. It works from EFIS BS, um, so you can, you can take and compile uh, microcode and put it on a flash drive, and from there you can apply the patches to your CPU. And uh, we did that and was hoping that it worked, but as soon as we booted up our Linux system that we're running on, all of our microcode patches, they were gone. And what our initial thought was like, oh, we can't read their code, uh, we don't understand it, it must be wrong, can't be anything else. So, of course, we started writing our own assembler, uh, and we turned out to be very wrong, and uh, their, per their code was running perfectly. But doing this, we took a, a kind of different approach. So, what you have seen so far has been their syntax, the example we had before. But we made a more dynamic library. So, actually, we made a uh, Linux dynamically shared library, um, that you can put in into any C project that can change microcode uh, on the fly. So the code, uh, the assembly code looks a bit more like this. So we have more dynamic tooling, but also at the cost of uh, syntax. So what we see here is our function is YOLO. Uh, the first value or the first array here is UCode patch. That is the one we are going to apply. It moves 1337 into one of the temp registers. Then it do dead beef into RBX, and it takes temp zero and moves into RAX. So nothing crazy going on here, and then it ends the instruction. Then we put, uh, then we use the patch view code function to put these um, instructions in the RAM area, and after that we will hook the um, the sys exit fun the sys exit instruction, and we use that one because it's kind of a nice playground instruction um, because it's never really used. Uh, by the Linux kernel or anyone, because it's a Intel only uh, instruction, so it doesn't work on AMD. And that is nice because when you fetch a Debian or Ubuntu or whatever, they will work on both both hardwares. So this instructions is a privileged instructions, never really used. So we'll snack that one and use it for our per and we purpose it as we like. Yeah. So we did that and we started to play around with uh, with the microcode. And one thing we could do with this more dynamic approach, and because our, we do it from the C language that we've absorbed for, so we also have the power of all of C, and it's, um, and it's uh, dynamic powers in that we can program. Uh, it, from C, we can program microcode changes versus putting it on a flash drive, flash drive and being more statically. So we did that, and we started just putting in, um, so we made microcode that traced where uh, is the current instruction pointer from macro code 
and where is the current microcode instruction pointer. Then we store that to the normal RAM address space, and we keep doing that. And at some point, when we lost our microcode changes, we know exactly at what instruction we were losing these changes. So we could backtrace how can we fix that. And then we, we discovered that in instruction, that's a instruction that's reading from the port I.O. space, so it's reading from hardware. Uh, we found that that has a lot of side effects. Uh, and when we took a look at the opposite one, the write instruction, it was like three lines, three instructions long. This one was a couple of hundred long. This has a, a, was way bigger than it should be. So it turns out that doing execution of the in instruction, they have a hidden side effect um, from Intel side where they check the state of the, uh, the micro-architectural state and reapplies microcode patches if something seems, seems odd. That's at least our interpretation of this. And what we did was that at first we just tried to nuke out uh, the entire instruction and see if we just like make it a big knob instruction and see if that would work. Well, it did work and we started keeping our microcode changes, but um, apparently the kernel needs this instruction. So now our kernel didn't work. But um, there's a solution for that. We just go uh, 10 instructions down, try and disable it from there. Uh, no worky. Okay, what about five instructions uh, longer down? And yeah, sure enough, when we, um, when we chopped off that half of the instruction, we started to getting stable microcode changes. So now we can update microcode from a Linux user space environment instead of just through a EFI shell. So yeah, that's nice. So uh, I think we're going to do a demo of this. Yeah, so uh, for the first demo, we're going to show this YOLO function, which uh, we had shown before. Um, so we're running uh, this on uh, the squared board, uh, which is already uh, read unlocked and exploited. Uh, so it's just ready to, uh, to run. If we look at this, uh, this code again, uh, let me just zoom in. Uh, this was the YOLO function. Uh, it sets uh, OX lead in RAX and OX dead in RBX. And then we have this wrapper around it, which has some inline assembly that just calls the SysSQ instruction. Um, if we then uh, just uh, open it up in GDB. So now we are right before the uh, YOLO uh, function. And if we step over it, now our patch should be applied. Uh, and now we're right at the sys exit instruction. So if we step now, what should happen, normally at least, is we should get a general protection fault, because this is a privilege instruction, um, and we are in user space. But what actually happens is that uh, if you look up at the top, uh, RAX is set to OX lead, and RBX is set to OX dead. So our patch was uh, successfully uh, added. Um, and now, for uh, probably the demonstration you've all been uh, waiting for, uh, the back door. Um, what uh, to show it? We are gonna open up a browser, um, and here we have uh, just a, a site hosted here with a sweet little uh, link here. Click to get a calc. Let's try and press it. And a cow pops. So, um, <laughs> so, so that's very neat. Uh, but our exploit actually doesn't uh, have anything to do with the JavaScript engine. So, wait, maybe if we open up Firefox. Uh, maybe. We will get another calc. <laughs> but we wanted something even more general than that. So if we actually just copy the image link here and, and pop it into our shell and just W get it, another calc pops. <laughs> uh, so. So apparently, just getting this image pops a calc. So uh, how the hell does that even work? Uh. OK, 
Hey, thanks. Uh, yeah, so you're probably all wondering how this works. So let's, um, so for this, when we were engineering this, we were for thinking about, okay, what kind of instructions can we target? What, where is the place that we should um, put this backdoor? So the RAM, the RAM is very limited, we have few spaces, and we needed a good instruction. What makes up a good instruction? Well, it needs to be run very frequently. So every program should be using this instruction. Furthermore, this instruction that we are hooking into needs to touch some kind of user-controlled data because like, we can't store the entire backdoor inside of this tiny uh, microcode space. So we need something that touches user, uh, that has user input. So our attention was drawn to the syscall instruction. The syscall instruction is the one in charge of handling uh, curl requests. So when you uh, make a syscall, you, in the RAX register, you put a number specifying what you would like the kernel to do. And in the uh, RCX register, the CPU will put the return address. So where should the kernel return to after the syscall has been handled? If it's successful, then we should send it back to user space at the address specified at RCX. And also, a nice feature is that a lot of syscalls take like parameters and that some of those can be that user data that we're looking for. So let's jump into some pseudo code. We can't show the entire microcode changes because it's very, very big. So we'll do a pseudo C thing that will tell how this backdoor works. So we hook the uh, syscall instruction right in the beginning of the syscall instruction. And then we first check, is this uh, is RAX says to a syscall write? Because if it's a write instruction, then it either writes to like standard out or it's doing file manipulation or stuff like that. So for example, if, if Chrome or Firefox is going to cache a image you need for later, then it will do a write to the file system. So that's pretty neat. Then the next check we made, make here is that we just check for a magic value. We don't want to execute Im every image pulled from the internet. So, and if, if one of these cases fail, go do the normal syscall. But if we hit both of these conditions, the first thing we'll do is that we will save the current state of the CPU. So we'll take all of the, the registers that we touched doing our actual shellcode, and we will store it into memory. So that's the, just what we're doing here. We'll save the state of the CPU so we can exit cleanly. After that, we talked about, we set RCX and we put it at RSI. And the reason we take RSI is because as the RSI register contains the, a address for the uh, image data. So that is the image data itself. And then we add a small offset and then we will now say, okay, kernel, when you're done doing your request, now this is a new address that you should return back to after handling um, whatever you're going to do. So when you return to user space, execute actually our image data. But now you may say, oh wait, hold on a minute. CPUs nowadays has, uh, memory, has MMUs, memory management units. So you can't just um, execute arbitrary data everywhere you like. That is the neat trick about the syscall instruction. Because Linux has a source call called mProtect. So instead of saving the image uh, and doing the right source call, well, let's uh, put a source call, uh, the source mProtect into Rx and change the request we make to the kernel and say to the kernel, hey, this address space in RSI, can you please go and make that read, write, and executable at the same time? And then, when the kernel jumps out of the kernel space, it will jump happily into executable uh, code that we control. That is our image. Oh well, it's stored in the metadata of the image, so you don't see any anything on the image itself. So let's briefly go over uh, what what shell code we actually put in. It's it's super simple. The first thing we do is do a fork, 
And uh, then we have two processes running in parallel. The parent process will now be the new main thread actually handling, uh, like, uh, handling the browser like Chrome stuff. So what we do is we restore the saved context from um, the ones we saved in memory just on, yeah. The step we did where we stored all the registers into the image data itself, we'll no, now pull that back out and put it back in place in the CPU in that thread. And then Chrome can continue its execution, happy, um, and won't notice that we have spawned a child thread. Now the child thread, that can just go do all the evil stuff it wants. In this case, it's probably a calculator. So, before we fi finalize, let's uh, look a bit at how did we do some of this reversing process. Of course, there has been some pioneers in the field that started out this uh, positive technology and um, yeah, custom processing, Unix, etc. But um, still, a lot of unknown instructions is there. So, how do you reverse um, instructions in a new microcode um, assembly language where half of the uh, opcodes is just doing unknown stuff. Well, one trick we did is that we used a lot of what we call side-by-side -side reversing. So on one half of the screen, we take the pseudo code for this instruction, and on the other half, we will have the actual implementation, and then we can go back and forth and see, oh, on this side, we have free compares there, or like free writes, or like looking for bit patterns in the pseudo code, and seeing, oh, we have the same free writes over in the actual implementation. And that, and just after that, we have that unknown thing, uh, the unknown opcode, but what is it in the pseudo code, and can we t extract in from, from that? That is one thing. Another is just like tracing, like the dynamic tracing we saw before, holding um, in the middle of instructions and pulling out the data, that could be like from GDP that you saw before. And also, um, yeah, just maybe copy pasting stuff. Like if we have a, uh, a big instruction, then copy paste the whole thing into the RAM address space and just redirect it. Now you have a clone and now you can start flipping one bit at a time and seeing what slight changes did that affect. Most of the time it's a CPU crash bit, but some of the times, we do get logging and we see different values in our register uh, after that instruction. Um, yeah, we talked a bit about playground instructions like susexit because it's never used, but there's actually more of these. So some of the uh, virtualization instructions for virtual machines, hyperization and stuff like that, that could be VM write, um, VM enter and some of the hyperization. Those, re those are instructions that is also never used unless you are doing virtual machines. But if you don't do that, these instructions will never be used. And some of those take arguments in form of registers. So there you get uh, playground instructions, which also happens to decode registers. So, and finally, before heading off, we want to talk about future work that we or even you might do because we are uploading everything right after this and making everything public. So we really wanted to find CPU bugs or should we say exploit CPU bugs because we actually get a little bit of help from Intel here. If we do apply our microcode patches, uh, the official ones from Intel, then we can also look, as, look inside the match and patch registers that we saw before. Now we know where do Intel like hook from and to in the ROM and RAM address space. So now we can have a look inside. What box has they already discovered and patched that we have never seen? Um, and our goal or hope is that we could red unlock the CPU. So put it into this Intel debug mode without having the physical access beforehand if we can abuse some of these bugs. We think that it could be possible that one could take control of the micro instruction pointer and point it to some of these debug instructions. That would be a very cool thing to do and hopefully we get the time to do it. Now, last, I want to say thank you to, especially to Kalma Union. They have been, uh, that's our CTF team. They have been a great help, both sponsoring, but also having a hundred plus hackers around always uh, available to answer any stupid questions you might have about a CPU. Like, really thank you guys. And also, 
really, uh, we acknowledge the work that Mark Elno, Positive Technology and Trust and Processing Unit has done to lay the ground for this uh, talk. Thank you for listening in, and do you all have some questions? Yeah, that's one. First question is, I can. So, so the question is, what other primitives, uh, primitives could you imagine building from this? So, in general, I think this is a very strong primitive, like putting a backdoor so hidden away. It's basically completely undetectable because the OS can can see it. Um, but I could imagine, like for example, uh, game hacking and stuff like that. Like you can hide it away from any uh, any uh, like a cheat engine check or stuff like that. I could imagine that could be useful there. Other than that, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's one. Where can you buy the dev bots? Okay, the dev bot is a op squared, and we, on the slide, you will find a link to our documentation, and on there it will have the exact uh, dev bot that we use. Uh, you can order it online, and we have a pre we have a flash image that you can just flash on it, and then you're ready to go to play with this. Okay, I think there's no more. Thank you for listening.